Okay, so this is day two of the grilling. <laughs> uh, I'll continue by reviewing uh, a little bit of the end of last um, portion of the talk. You can see I'm only at page 33, I'm 66. And I was supposed to get to page 66 yesterday, but that's okay. I, as I said at the beginning of yesterday's talk, um, the slower the better. Um, and if you have questions, please interrupt, and I'm sure that you will, based on yesterday's uh, enthusiasm. <laughs> so, um, but basically, just to review um, the derivation of the, the quadstropic model, it's a, it's a key model. Um, it can be derived, as I was speaking with Nathan just a minute ago, um, there are lots of ways of deriving this model. Um, I'm driving in, in one way that I would call traditional, a la Pedlowski, or people that have written like textbooks on this um, subject. I'm not an advocate of this kind of method, but it's one way of, of approaching this problem, but it can be, as we were discussing, misleading. Um, in fact, in some cases, um, asymptotic approximations like this can be, um, the asymptotic series can be, uh, um, well, not asymptotic in the sense that uh, higher order terms could be more important than lower order terms you've kept. You have to be careful. And the only way to really know whether you've done things correctly is to compare with the parent model. You need to go back and say, okay, I've done QG, that's my quadstrophic theory, does it actually work? And you then run a model, the parent model, the parent model will be the shallow water model, and then how does the QG model compare with the shallow water model? And then likewise, you might say with the shallow model, water model, is it a good model or not? How do I know that? I need to compare it with where it came from, and on and on and on, what you do. So every model that you're reducing to, you need to then a posteriori do the hard work, that's the hardest part, go back and check that it actually is a consistent model. And often this is not done. I mean, it, it, there are occasions where this is, this is done, but usually mathematicians get so wrapped up in the beauty of the mathematical forms they find that they stop there and they say, look, I've got this wonderful model and it has all these interesting things, maybe the singularity formation going on, and wow, we got singularities, and they don't realize that the singularities themselves may actually violate the assumptions they make. So these are just warnings that, uh, you know, in geophysical fluid dynamics, there may be singularities occurring in the fluid at micro scales that we don't know about, but we typically don't worry about that. We typically expect regularity, um, but there's no guarantee of that, especially in these complex flows. Okay, so going back to shallow water, we're gonna start with given uh, equations. So the, the equations are um, up here. Um, so, you know, X and Y momentum equations, height is the full depth of the fluid, or H is the full depth of the fluid, and then the mass continuity equation here. So we're gonna start from here. I've now corrected what the frequency is. Coriolis frequency is here two omega, or if you wanna think of an F-plane projection on a spherical planet, small enough scales in the latitude and direction, you might have a sign of the latitude here, local latitude. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna take these as my mathematical system that I'm gonna start with. There are three variables. The key thing, U, V, and W, or U, V, and H here. Um, and uh, they're, um, so we expect uh, complex or rich dynamics, and we know that there's a lot of interesting behavior. I would, I would regard shallow water, and a lot of people regard shallow water as the, as the basic model to understand balance and imbalance, which is what I'm going, I'm heading towards. That is trying to separate slow central vorticity controlled motions, what I call balanced motions, from the remainder, which is called imbalance, and these are often called inertial gravity waves. And while that separation will come to that later, cannot be perfect. I've already taken so much time on one slide that we have a way of forcing this not to go to sleep. Oh, doesn't like my password even, okay. All right, so let's move on. All right, so the next uh, uh, thing we do is, uh, um, is to traditionally, we'll say this again, this is not what you always have to do, but typically people assume that there are characteristic lengths um, for the X and Y scales, uh, characteristic displacement from the free surface mean depth, which is a constant, a physical constant in any problem. Um, a characteristic velocity scale, which is not specified, may be problematic, and a characteristic time scale, which we immediately eliminate by looking for the time scale where both the partial time derivative and the advective part of the material derivatives are comparable. That's the sort of preferred scaling in this problem. That's an important scaling because it's already telling you that this model's leading to 
um, slow potential vorticity control motions. I didn't have to do this. I could have chosen a different scaling where I favor fast gravity waves, but I'm trying to eliminate the gravity waves in the quasi-strophic model, so we, we choose this scaling for um, the time derivative. And there's a zoo of models out there. I'm not going, I mean, if I spent um, the next few days just going through the probably 20 or 30 different models there are, you can derive depending on parameter ratios and whether you include beta, et cetera, planetary vorticity gradient, you, you see there's actually a vast number of models out there and there's probably thousands if not more papers written on all the different extensions and vari variations of this model. But this is the core model. The quasi-strophic model I'm talking about is the, the simplest of all that you can derive. It assumes this subjective time scale. Um, and then it goes on and says, so really we, once you've done this, you, you have three parameters left um, that you need to choose. So L, D, and U so far. Um, you're going to use um, tilde variables to indicate dimensionless quantities. Um, you do this, stick this into the equations before. Yes. Um, because you, you filter them out because they appear at um, higher orders in the small parameters when they appear in the equation. So you strike them out. When you struck out those higher order terms, you eliminate the gravity waves. I'll show you how it happens. Yeah. You don't know it yet, but you do know it's there because what's going to happen at leading order is that you're going to consider the Rossby number, which is U over FL, to be small, which means you can strike out, there's the gravity waves gone. Okay. Gravity waves are eliminated when you strike out the horizontal momentum, the D by DU DT, and you leave only the geostrophic uh, wind over here, geostrophic velocity, okay? So there you lose the gravity waves right there in the first order. Um, and here you're going to take this small as well, so you're gonna end up striking out this term, but this divergence of the velocity field is consistent with the fact that this is actually a non-divergent flow, um, taking F equals constant, of course. Um, the group here, constants here, we're going to be taking to be one so that we get the, um, that actually it tells us that the displacement scale is actually determined in terms of other scales we've introduced. So now we're down to just U and L, our two arbitrary scales we're not happy about. Nathan's particularly not happy about that. But so far we had to introduce only two scales in deriving this model. Um, so we have these three parameter groups that appear here. Two of them are small, U over FL, um, Rossby number it'll be, and then the aspect ratio, displacement scale over the depth of the fluid, that's small. Um, and this is going to be effectively one for us. And that's what's stated here. The Rossby number is a small parameter here. We're also taking the aspect ratio to be small. Um, and geostrophic balance arises when we basically ignore the um, DUDT, DVDT terms. Um, so alpha much smaller than one means that this free, dis free surface displacements are small compared to the mean depth. Uh, and together they give you this non-divergence condition. So that allows us to basically introduce a string function, kind of unnecessary because the string function is in this case, with this choice of parameters G, D over F, A, U, L to be one, string function is just the displacement. But later on, I'll be using the string function to, to uh, denote the leading order displacement rather than just the full displacement because we'll be doing a Rossby number expansion soon where this, order one term, all tilde terms are order one, will be expanded into a lowest order part, e to tilde zero plus higher order terms. But now, to, this is another correction slide, which I was, uh, um, I did um, earlier. So the alpha much less than one, so the, the aspect ratio being small, so the displacement scale divided by the mean depth being small requires that if you put in uh, what D is, so D is, is chosen, so this is, group of parameters is one. So that tells you that D, D is F U L over G. We stick it over here, divide by H, you get this parameter group. Now if I multiply top and bottom by U and separate things a bit, I get U squared or GH, which look, should look like a, uh, either a squared Mach number or a fruit number squared. Um, and then the inverse of the Rossby number appearing here. So this is what you can write this as. This is a dimensionless parameter fruit number squared of a Rossby number where the fruit number is defined as the characteristic velocity scale divided by a physical scale, which turns out to be the short scale gravity wave speed, um, root gh. It's interesting that this scale appears, but there are no gravity waves um, in this model in the end. Uh, but it, it's key, a key scale, and um, this and the Coriolis frequency are going to make the deformation length that will be the only physical scale left in the model when everything is done and dusted. Um, 
So anyway, the, the key thing is that the aspect ratio being small tells you that the ratio of these two parameters groups is small, which then tells you the traditional requirement for QG theory to be valid, which is the square of the free number must be much smaller than the Boltzmann number, which is smaller than one, okay? Well, you, you need this to be small so that the third equation is consistent with the first two. Because if I'm striking out these two equations, I must have that the flow is not divergent to the Yes. Yeah, that's right. In fact, a lot of people avoid PV altogether and just write an equation for each and they're done. Okay? I like PV. Okay, a lot of people do, but uh, maybe I, I like it too much, but it's a key variable, so... We're going to continue with that. So then, all right, so the fruit number must be much less than one. Um, and it just simply says the flow speeds are small compared to gravity wave speeds, which is root GH, where it said that. Um, so now we need to go to one higher order. So what we have so far are only diagnostic relations. This is the so-called, this is where you would stop if you were simply trying to deduce geostrophic balance from given data. So you look at the sea surface height, for instance, and you try to pull out the velocity field that's, that's a balanced um, approximation or a balanced relations. But now if you want to actually create a dynamical self-consistent model, you need to go higher order. You need to get the time derivatives back somehow. And you do that basically by doing a Rossby number expansion, assuming the fruit number is comparable or smaller than the Rossby number. Now here's where a whole plethora of new models can arise where you could take a different scaling where the fruit number is comparable to the square root of Rossby number and then you get something called a semi dystrophic or um, model that uh, is different, and I'm not going to discuss that, but depending on choices you make here, and if you include the corial frequency varying with latitude, there are other kinds of models that you can get, called planetary dystrophic, et cetera, et cetera. And depending on how you combine, you know, once you get to three or four parameters, there's almost endless combinations. There's, there's an explosion of models that take place when you have so many small parameters. Here we're living with two, the fruit number and Rosman number, I'm going to require the fruit number is no larger than the Rosman number in magnitude, but typically comparable or less. Um, I've done lots of numerical simulations and I've tried to push the shallow water model to extremes and I've deduced what the Rosman number and fruit number are. And typically it's hard to make the fruit number bigger than the Rosman number in these experiments. It's pretty difficult uh, to do that. Um, at least for flows that start from a reasonably well-balanced initial state. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we take the velocity, um, expand it. Uh, so these remember tilde quantity means that it's order one. So here's the leading order part, but then we're going to say there's correction of order Rossby number. Again, u tilde one will be also order one, but the small parameter is sitting out in front. Likewise, for every other field, we're going to expand it. Um, and then at leading order in Rossby number, the, um, the geostrophic balance comes out um, of the equations. I'm not going to go back and forth all the time, but basically you get the X and Y velocity components in terms of the derivatives of the leading order displacement. Uh, but we don't know eta, should we eta tilde zero there? Another correction to make later, or maybe tomorrow. Um, and then at first order um, in Rosman number, if we go back to the momentum equations um, and collect all the terms proportional to the first order in Rosman number, you get the V1 by moving what was on the right-hand side, uh, um, multiplying the Coriolis parameter, on the left-hand side, and then you get a partial e to one partial x um, term, um, and then you get terms that only depend on the leading order velocity field. And the same thing is true for um, u tilde one, that you get um, a leading part which depends on displacement at the first order, plus leading order terms with zero subscripts. So these are good terms. That's a bad term because um, we seem to be going nowhere unless we can get rid of um, the first order terms. And miraculously, this is what happens if we look at the eta tilde equation. So this is, this is from the u velocity component, the u, u equation, the v equation. This is the displacement equation or the height equation or mass continuity. You get at first order in Rossby number, you get this ratio of parameters, which will have to be of order one, plus possibly smaller, um, times a group of order one terms plus the divergence of u tilde one. Remember, u tilde one 
the slide up here is easy to order one term by assumption. So um, for this, for these terms to be balanced, this term could be of order one, but it could actually be negligible. And that's one of the models you can get. That when this group of terms is taken to zero, you get back the two-dimensional um, model that I started with yesterday. So the 2D flow Euler equations, which not Euler equations, but the 2G limit to go to the two-dimensional flow where you have a stream function vorticity form is obtained when this term is neglected. But we're going to consider this to be order one in most cases. All right, so for consistency, for consistency, we have to take that this to be order one or smaller. Um, and the nice thing is that the first terms in U1 and U and V1 are non is non-divergent. That means if I take the divergence of U1 and V1 to calculate this term here, the, the E to one cancels. So you take D by D Y of that and D by the X of this, these terms cancel. And what's left over is something involving only the leading order fields, which is a miracle. Okay. That's the miracle of deriving QG model. It doesn't happen in lots of um, PD um, calculations. If you do this kind of thing, it doesn't always work this way, but for QG it does. Um, then if you basically you know, do the calculations by hand, I didn't want to do this, but taking the divergence of U1 and uh, manipulating U and V, you get basically the um, material derivative, the D by DT plus U dot grad is like a material derivative of the geostropic wind times what's called zeta zero, which is the leading order vertical vorticity field. Um, then combining this, if you define this combination, the reason why that's there is that if you now look at this equation here, this divergence here is d zeta dt, okay? And if I add this plus this term right here, uh, combining, there's another, there's another thing which is d eta, d, d eta naught dt. So there's a d zeta dt here, a d eta naught dt here, multiplied by some group of terms. If you combine them, you can show that this combination here is materially conserved. So you get this simple equation that tells you that um, Q tilde naught um, is advected by the leading order geostrophic wind field here. This is a self-contained closed um, equation only involving leading order terms. We've eliminated all the first order terms um, doing this. And this is called the QG potential vorticity in a completely non-dimensional uh, way. So we still haven't restored dimensions. Any questions about that? Okay. So if then we go on, so remember earlier we introduced the stream function. We're going to call that stream function just the leading order term displacement field. This comes from geostrophic balance. Um, that allows us to basically rewrite this, the PV in terms of the stream function, in terms of, in terms of instead of e to tilde zero, you have this form. And then concerning this ratio, fruit over Rosser number squared, if you restore what the definition of fruit number is, u over root gh, you square it, and the Rosser number squared, u squared over fl squared, f squared, l squared, you cancel very same terms like u squared is there. Then you can write this in terms of f squared, l squared over gh. f, g, and h are all physical lengths that we know. They can be combined into a new length, which is called the deformation length, the Rosby deformation length, the Rosby deformation radius. They have, again, this, this has many uh, different names. Um, I'm calling it the deformation length, LD. Um, and it has, it's a physical length, which is just the root GH uh, divided C, the wave speed divided by the Coriolis frequency. Um, so then using this scale, you can rewrite the potential vorticity once again in terms of a Laplace to the stream function and a ratio of length scales. The length scale we introduced originally and this LD scale that is a physical scale, sine stream function, okay? And so what have we learned? It's, it says basically that given the potential vorticity field, one can find um, psi, the stream function, by not inverting a Laplacian, but inverting a Helmholtzian operator. It's not that difficult. Numerically, people love this kind of thing because it's an easy equation to uh, invert in either the infinite plane or you can do it in, in W periodic geometry. It's very nice or in a channel geometry. These are, this is a very easily inverted problem. So you can find the stream function. Now, given the stream function, of course, stream function generates the velocity field. And given the velocity field, then you can move the potential vorticity field to the next instant of time. So it's a self-contained dynamical system. There's nothing else. We don't require any of the first order fields. But if we wanted to, we could get them for free, but we don't need them here. Uh, so this is a closed system of equations. One scalar evolution equations left over. And that 
uh, and we filtered the gravity waves, as mentioned before, and we dropped the um, advection of the horizontal velocity field. So there's only the slow potential vorticity evolution left over. Um, and all the business of inverting that stream function, getting the velocity field is called PV inversion. And it's the simplest way of doing inversion in this model or in any, any model, okay? Now, okay, this, perhaps you don't like all the tildes. Um, we can clean things up now. So if we then go back and restore dimensions using the characters that scales L, D, and U, they, they all disappear from the equations and you're left only with the one physical length scale um, LD appearing in the Poisson equation relating, or really the Helmholtz equation relating stream function and potential vorticity. And you still have the geostrophic uh, winds here, and you still have potential vorticity evolution. So you have one parameter in this simple quasitropic model. And it's a complete model. Okay, so we've used basically the simplest ingredients to produce a single evolution equation for the slow material transport of PV. I'm saying slow because I'm comparing this with the relatively fast um, gravity waves, which will be appearing at speeds that are roughly ordered Rossby number inverse, one over Rossby number faster than the potential vorticity of evolution. And then you'll have linear inversion relations that provide the flow field from PV field. This is also very important. The fact that they're linear um, is unusual. Um, that um, the quasi model doesn't require any kind of iteration. It's guaranteed to produce a solution. Given potential vorticity field, there's all kinds of mathematical properties. Because it's a transported field here, the maximum and minimum values can never change in time. And um, the inversion of this is, there's a lot of regularity, the Helmholtz operator here. So you can prove millions of things about the system. The system is known to be regular. It doesn't exhibit any singular motions or anything else. It's a very robust system. Okay, and it produces things like this. So, yeah. Well, but D by DT itself needs to be, you, you, T, D by DT has, has a scale of, well, I know, Omega, but Omega has a, has a Frequency scale, you need to compare it against something else. Frequency over F, I guess, you would do. Right. So you say D by T, you still have to introduce a T and an F and go through the procedure of doing that. Um, well, when you when you do that, you end up getting the same thing because the Rossby number is exactly the characteristic frequency divided by um, the Coriolis frequency. So your omega that you introduce is the equivalent of my L over U, if I've got that right, yes. The L over U, the, the time scale introduced is the omega scale or inverse omega scale you introduce. It would come out the same thing. And that's indeed, you'll see that in textbooks some people will use it in terms of frequency expansions. Because the idea is that there's a separation of frequency between the low frequency potential vorticity and the high frequency gravity waves, and the gap is zero to F, if you like. Not that simple, but that's uh, the way people think. Yeah. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm not headed to a match asymptotic or a further. Yeah, I agree that if you do a two time scale analysis, the, again, this leads to again a, another zoo of models out there where people have looked at uh, interaction in fast and slow scales, trying to see when gravity waves have impacts. And it turns out to be very subtle. Um, the linear order part here is not, is not subtle, but um, the, the feedback of gravity waves on the balanced motion is subtle. You don't think it is? All right. Well, I mean, I've been sort of following work by Jacques Benes, who's been doing some, some of this stuff. Uh, there's been, um, I know myself with uh, Ali Moheb Hoje years ago, when we were doing this in like the early 2000s, we were just looking into, um, Basically, the by we're actually trying to measure the impact of gravity waves on the balance motion, and depending on how careful you are in setting up the balance flow, that impact gets less and less and less. 
you can make it almost negligible. And that's what led us to something called optimal PV balance, which I won't discuss at all. That's not forced to, I might be forced to, uh, <laughs> this audience. Uh, but, no, all right, I'll continue. Yeah, otherwise I'll get it's easy into a long tangent away, but okay. So, why we, so let's just sort of summarize what we've done here. So this is where I want to start again today. So um, what have we lost here? So we basically started with a um, uh, shallow water model. We got a QG model, which is certainly capable of exhibiting, you know, this is, you know, it's complicated, right? You can argue this is turbulent, um, but we've lost some things. We've lost um, two of the time derivatives of the, of the three prognostic variables. because We know that that's been eliminated by dropping the DUDT and DVDT in the um, momentum equations. Um, so what's happened here, of course, is that the QG model filters relatively high frequencies. In linear theory, these frequencies are frequencies greater than or equal to the Coriolis frequency. In nonlinear theory, or for unsteady basic states, or for steady basic states that have um, non-trivial flows, it's not so simple. So the, the general pe picture people like to do is, is simply say that, okay, you have all the low frequency potential vorticity motions essentially near zero, and then you have a big gap to Coriolis frequency, and then all the gravity waves are up there. Reality is that if you start with like a jet flow, and then you go through and try to decompose into linear theory, you find that they're all mixed. The Rossby waves, the gravity waves are all mixed together. You can't do this decomposition anymore. And the problem which I'll come to in, well, hopefully this week now, I'm starting to worry, but I think by maybe Friday, um, there's a beautiful problem of a so-called potential vorticity front, which gets onto the subject of jets, um, looking at these banded circulation patterns, and, and you know we have jets, uh, jet streams and ocean currents, et cetera. But there's a simple model of a jet, um, which you can think of as a PV jump. And you can imagine that you could take a PV jump, which is um, sort of sinusoidal and oscillated ever so slightly, okay? It'll wobble around and it, it looks like Rossby waves. So there'll be kind of a restoring mechanism which will cause it to, to propagate uh, westward. So you have the usual propagation mecha mecha mechanism at play. Um, but in doing that in the shallow water equations, one would expect to excite gravity waves. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's a non-trivial basic state. A velocity field is non-trivial in the steady in the basic flow, and the frequency spectrum is no longer nicely separated like this. And so what really happens is that all these models are trying to separate potential vorticity from gravity waves in some way, but that there's no perfect decomposition except in the linear theory on a resting basic state. And it's the only place that it works. Okay, everywhere else, we're all in a big mess, and we're trying to say, okay, well, we don't worry about the tail of, of frequencies that are associated with moving potential vorticity that are extending into high frequencies. It, it makes sense. If you, take any, if you take any arbitrary disturbance, even a Gaussian disturbance, it will fall off maybe very, fa very fast, but some of the frequencies will be still sticking into the high frequency end, and you're cutting those off. You're simply throwing them out. So some of the, what we call balanced motions, actually have frequencies that are extending into high frequencies, and we throw those out. So I'm just saying this is some of the, the worries that people have all the time about trying to you know, distinguish between balanced and imbalanced motions, gravity waves and potential vortices. There's no really clean distinction, except in the beautiful linear theory on a, on a basic state at rest. So anyway, another justification, despite that, all the caveats I've had there, we have analyzed nonlinear flows that are com complicated and interesting. Um, and even in these cases, gravity waves tend to be energetically weak and have very, very little back reaction on potential vorticity. This depends, of course, on how you set up and prepare initial conditions. But in ba nearly balanced flows, flows that are set up to be uh, um, balanced in some way, this is true. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, before I get into an endless debate about balance, which will come in the next lecture anyway. Um, I'd like to now, if I go to another derivation, which is start from the full 3D equations. Well, full, there's no full equations, but we're gonna start from 3D Euler equations, the ones we started with a long time ago yesterday, seems like a long time ago, um, but we're gonna have a free surface on it. Oh no no! This is that that, that was that's still the two D shallow water equations. 
the single layer, or what they call the single layer shallow water. This is fully 3D, so it varies continuously in Z or Z, okay? But the difference here is I'm gonna allow a free surface. So now we're gonna think about a flat bottom flow. I mean, I could again put topography if I wanted to, and you can do that. But then we're gonna have a, a free surface on this. And the idea is that, well, shallow water theory tells us that free surface should have very long waves, okay? And we're gonna drive shallow water from that. And then what we're gonna do here, hopefully, um, is um, show that the shallow water model compares well with the 3D equations, okay? But we're gonna find that there's a better model that compares even better than that, okay? For these equations, okay? Now, so just to start um, everything out again, so we're gonna start with everything exact now. So this is basically the exact system of equations for constant density, uh, uniform layer of constant density with a free surface. So this is just the usual momentum equations with now the Coriolis frequency, um, F here taken to be constant for simplicity. Uh, the vertical, we're, we're separating the vectors here correspond to two dimensional vectors in all cases. Operators are two dimensional operators. That's the two dimensional divergence operator, divergence operator here. Um, the, I guess the exception is using EZ here, which is a vertical unit vector here, but to, that's to be understood is basically skewing the velocity field in the usual way that Coriolis does. Uh, the vertical acceleration equation is separated because it's special. We're gonna do something with it. If we drop the right left-hand side, we get the usual expression of um, hydrostatic balance, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, then um, the mass continuity or the divert, no, divergence of velocity field, we said it's 3D incompressible, so we're gonna write it this way. So we start writing the equations in kind of ugly way because it actually makes it easier to drive what comes next. Shallow water equations are probably easiest to drive from the set. All right, so what do we, so the reason I'm bringing this up is that we actually had to write a numerical model which did the 3D flow with a free surface. And so we actually need to know how will we solve these equations? What are the boundary conditions and how we do it? So um, P is some sort of scale pressure on density since it's a constant here. Um, and um, the boundary conditions. So at the bottom, easy. The bottom, we have W equals zero, no vertical uh, motion. And if, no, if there's no vertical motion, looking at this equation, there can't be an acceleration of the vertical velocity field either. And so we have um, hydrostatic balance appearing at z equals zero. So the bottom has this um, sort of what's called a Neumann boundary condition um, on pressure. Um, and then at the top, um, the vertical acceleration is just given by the rate of change of the uh, free surface height. So it's basically um, the, the particles on the free surface are moving up and down with the fluid. It's a material surface, so you get this equation. And there we're going to assume that the uh, pressure is some kind of given atmospheric pressure for this model, the incompressible model doesn't matter what it is, we can take it to be a constant or zero, so we're gonna take it to be zero for simplicity. Um, it's a problem in compressible atmospheric models because trying to determine, everybody knows this, but anyway. So we're gonna keep things easy. Um, I have to resist going on tangents. It's more fun to do tangents than, than to, <laughs> anyway. So pressure is zero at z equals h. h is the free surface. h depends on x and y and t, so it's a dynamically moving uh, surface. I haven't written down the equation for H, but that will follow uh, from here. So now um, it's convenient to separate the pressure into a hydrostatic part, which is just G times H minus Z, satisfying the upper boundary condition that it's zero at Z equals H, um, and a remaining non-hydrostatic part, which I'm gonna call PN for non-hydrostatic, which is the difference between the full pressure and the hydrostatic part. And the nice thing is that then for the non-hydrostatic part, the its partial derivative at the bottom is zero, and its value at the top is zero. So it's a mixed neumann dirichlet problem for pressure, okay? Okay, so it's just a, a numerical problem if you had to solve this in, in principle, and this is what you have to, have, to, have to do in 3D. You don't do this in shallow water, but in the full three-dimensional equations we're still solving here. You can then write the equations for the momentum. Um, horizontal momentum is shown here, so here's the hydrostatic pressure part, which we retain in the shallow water approximation. And then there's a non-hydrostatic contribution of the pressure here. And the vertical acceleration now is purely coming from the non-hydrostatic pressure. So it shows directly if I just put PN equals zero, I'm getting, well, in fact, if I put PN equals zero here, we drop this equation entirely, it looks like the hydrostatic system. 
But of course, we, we're, we haven't told you anything about what the horizontal velocity field is looking like yet. In other words, it has to be independent of height. We'll come to that later. Well, continuing with the full 3D problem with no approximations, you can take the divergence of, of this, the, actually the, the 3D divergence of these, this set of equations here to derive a diagnostic equation. This is well known for incompressible flow. You can always diagnose pressure from everything else. And everything else is the velocity field, which is embedded in the vort vertical vorticity, the height field here, um, and then the various velocity components written in terms of Jacobian operators. So these are standard, basically, this means the UDX dV dy minus the UDY dV dx and so on, okay? You don't need to remember this equation. We're never gonna see it again, but it's just saying that if I wanted to calculate the pressure, I have to do it this way, okay? And for some of the results I'll show you in a moment, we go and solve this whole set of equations with these boundary conditions. Okay, now, when the mean depth, of course, is small compared to, again, here comes the characteristic length scale L, which we don't know, um, then it's common to approximate the dynamics by the shallow water equations, which we've seen before, or by an extended model called the green Nagdi equations, which really, they come from Sere, um, who about 15 years earlier derived the equations, but actually, there's even earlier work that goes back to late 1900 or 1800s, um, by the Corseret brothers or something, there's twin brothers that actually came up with the idea, but in a one-dimensional setting of including the non-hydrostatic effect. So it's an old subject, not quite as old as the shallow water equations because they were derived in 1871 by Saint-Vanon, uh, but their uh, Serre was is probably credited with these equations, although almost everyone calls them the green Nagdi equations, okay? Green Nagdi, to give them credit, they um, they went through um, a more careful derivation of the equations. They explained where they come from. They also explained um, that using asymptotic methods to derive them can be dangerous, okay? Um, and uh, they said that you can get inconsistent results by using asymptotic approximations um, to get these equations. Anyway, so let's see how um, they start. So this, the way they start is very similar to a very, I'm not gonna go through the calculus of variations and the general variational way of driving these models, but uh, in principle, what I'm saying is mathematically identical without having the rigor behind it. What they do is you start out by saying, let's make an assumption that the horizontal velocity field is independent of Z. And if you do that only, and you work through the algebra, what you get is the, green, the Serre green nagdi equations. If that's all you need to know, that's all, the, that, that's all there is to it. If you then further assume that you have hydrostatic balance, which is not necessary, then you get our traditional shallow water equations. So shallow water approximation are two approximations. You make two assumptions. I wouldn't say, or then maybe approximation, assumption, what do you want to call it? But here's one assumption, the velocity, horizontal velocity is independent of depth. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, that comes from, if you do an analysis of uh, free surface waves on a fluid of finite depth, and that depth is shallow, you'll see that the decay scale um, of uh, free surface waves um, tends to be uh, proportional to the wavelength of the wave. And so you might think, okay, then, you know, base of flow, then flow field should be independent of depth, nearly independent of depth for long waves. So it's a long wave theory, okay? And yet, um, the green Nagy model is kind of inconsistent with that because it's wanting to be able to resolve shorter waves comparable to the depth of fluid, yet it's assuming that the, the horizontal velocity field still doesn't depend on the variation of depth. Yet it goes, it gets, um, it gives a much more accurate uh, description of the um, shallow water dynamics in the 3D system. So we'll come to that in a minute. Now, I'm not saying that there are probably other systems like if you have stratified flow where density varies in the vertical, you have baroclinical processes, there may be other things that take place. But in this system, um, I can demonstrate that if you start from a two-dimensional flow in the three-dimensional equations, the green Nagdi equations are much more accurate than the shallow water equations. We demonstrate that. And you'll see those results maybe in the second hour today, okay? Um, hmm? That's right. It's the dropping of, and you know, green Nagdi is not itself completely consistent because we're going, I'm going to show you results that show that both green Nagdi and shallow water are inconsistent. They, 
they make assumptions about the, you know, the horizontal velocity being independent of depth, but they're clearly results that you can deduce from a three-dimensional model showing that those approximations are violated and sometimes strongly. And yet, shallow water still gives a very good approximation, three mag even better. So it's surprising. You get more from these models than you should expect. And just like QG gives you far more from that model than it should ever give you, because you can push it to Rossby number order one and see that qualitatively and partly quantitatively, you're getting things that you get in shallow water. Okay, it's really hard to break QG. And likewise, for shallow water, you get much more than um, you originally bargained for. All right, so we're making this basic assumption. See what happens if we make that assumption, see how far we go. All right, so the first thing is that um, that immediately tells you if you go back to this equation, um, where do I have it? No, it's already back here. So if you go back to this equation here, um, um, the three-dimensional divergence of the velocity field is zero. If u is independent of depth, then this is a function independent of depth. I can just integrate this in z or z. And then that gives me this equation, w equals minus delta z, where delta is the horizontal divergence of the horizontal velocity field. So that's just a function of x and y and t. And w is a linear function of z. is exactly the same as in shallow water. Um, you make the same approximation. And then if you apply this at z equals h into the boundary condition on w, w must be equal to dh dt, that's what gives you the traditional um, shallow water mass continuity equation. Okay, so you're done. All right, now, if you vertically average the horizontal momentum equations, this is the next step. So um, the horizontal momentum equations are written here. If u is independent of depth to begin with, then vertically averaging is making no difference to this term. U is independent of depth already, so vertical averaging doesn't change this. Likewise, it doesn't change this. The only equation it changes is the pressure term, the non hydrostatic pressure term, and P bar n is defined by um, the integral over zero to h of the three dimensional Pn field, which depends on z. We don't know this. We call this the vertically integrated non hydrostatic pressure. Okay? And the objective in the Green Magdi equations is to work out an equation to deduce this in terms of just the x and y um, system, not z. Okay, so where did I get to? Okay. All right, so then going back to shallow water. So in shallow water, you furthermore assume that uh, Pn, so all you have to do is say that you're in hydrostatic balance, Pn equals zero, and voila, you have your equations. That's what we saw before. Um, they come directly from just the single assumption that we have horizontal flow independent of depth, and then the further assumption that the non hydrostatic pressure is zero, so hydrostatic balance. Okay? And noticeably, no asymptotic exp expansion and small parameters necessary to do this. You make that single assumption and you've got your equations. Kind of cleaner to do it this way than the other way. And it has all the vari invariance as well in terms of uh, conservation laws, which I'm not going to discuss yet. I'll come to those in a moment. But Green and Agni very carefully is a beautiful paragraph that they write here in their JFM paper in 1976, that such expansions um, and small parameters do not guarantee consistency. They don't guarantee that you're gonna conserve all quantities. Like you may not have a potential vorticity invariant, you may not have energy conservation, et cetera. There are many examples where people publish papers where they do asymptotic expansions and well, they don't even bother calculating what the energy would look like in your equations because it's too messy, but it may not be conserved. And so, you know, you have to be, this is something that, that's you think is basic and fundamental that you should ensure. Um, anyway, they show that if you just do the vertically averaging here, you can derive a consistent model um, even more accurate than shallow water by not imposing hydrostatic approximation. Okay, so that's the whole point is how do I get P bar n? This is the vertically integrated non-hydrostatic pressure. So the way to do that is um, start by from the complete vertical force balance. So this is the exact equation relating vertical velocity and non-hydrostatic pressure, which now depends on Z here, or Z. Um, we noticed that before, incompressibility uh, gives us that W is delta times Z, or Z. I don't know, I, I'll keep going Z. I'm, I'm not sure what I should be saying anymore um, with the Austrian version. You're, you're okay, you can understand. It's all right. You can translate, okay, good. <laughs> it's from 40 years nearly in the UK that uh, has corrupted me. Okay, so anyway. Uh, delta is this, it's independent of Z. So if I plug this form on the left-hand side here, 
expand it out, then just doing the calculation derivatives, then you get minus d delta dt times z minus delta w. And um, so this can be combined using the expression for w here again. You get this expression involving delta and its time derivative, effective time derivative, multiplied by z. So this is a whole linear function of z, and that's associated to the right-hand side. Well, I think this is a, one of the easiest differential equations to integrate, except maybe if it's zero on the left-hand side, it'd be better. But OK, it's a linear function of z. I can integrate that. You get half z squared, and you get a free constant of integration. Of course, it's a partial derivative of z. Therefore, the function you get is a function of x, y, and t here, and you need to define that somehow. And it's determined by the single boundary condition um, satisfied by Pn, which is the, well, in fact, there's two of them. But the way this has been constructed already satisfies the bottom boundary condition, as I'll mention. But the upper boundary condition is going to determine what P0 is. So at z equals 0, um, the vertical derivative of, the, of Pn is automatically satisfied. And at z equals h, we impose that Pn equals 0. That's our boundary condition. And that determines this um, function P0. And then you can therefore show Pn is equal to P0 times a quadratic function like this. So this, you can see it vanishes um, at the top, z equals capital A or z equals h, and at the bottom it has the, well, with, you can check that this is equal to true. Then for the reduced model, all we need then is to integrate this over uh, the depth of the fluid. So we just need to perform the integration zero to h of pn, which we now know is a function of z, a very simple function. And we calculate that, you get two thirds of p naught, and therefore, using the function of p naught here, you get this expression, which was the famous one derived by Serre originally. Um, and Green Nagdi then uh, talked about this. It's also in as a paper, a very important paper by Miles and Salmon. I may mention this later on in the slide, where they talk about um, this and the conservation laws in the um, the, the system. Uh, so p bar n is given entirely in terms of derivative, time derivative of delta, delta itself and the depth of the fluid cubed here, okay? Now, if I stopped here, and almost everybody had done so up until we wrote a paper about 2018, 2019, um, they, there was a paper, the only other paper that went further was a paper by Daryl Holm, uh, who would do these kinds of things, where he was looking at other ways. In fact, this story goes back to a earlier Russian work where they, found that there's a way of making the equations more explicit by introducing a so-called momentum variable. So I'm not gonna discuss that formulation, but there, you can find that in some of the references I'll give in a moment. Um, but there's a simpler way of doing this. There's a simpler way of um, avoiding an implicit system. Why is this implicit? So notice that in this equation here, I have a time derivative of delta sitting here. So P bar N depends on a time derivative of delta through this, this operator right here. So that's partial time derivative plus the vector part. Now, P bar n has to go back into um, this equation. So if I were to stop, this is where Green and Agni stopped and Sari stopped. You take, or here's my full equation for momentum, and now I have an expression for P bar n, but P bar n depends on d delta dt. And delta is the derivative, is the divergence of that quantity. So there's a time derivative sitting over here in this mess, there's a time derivative sitting over here. The time derivative is multiplied by nonlinear functions over here. It's not nice. So this system is actually difficult numerically to deal with. So we want to try to avoid that. And it turns out that you can um, avoid that by noticing that I can take a divergence, a horizontal divergence of this equation, right? And this will allow me to get um, a d by dt on the divergence by doing some vector calculus on the, on the left-hand side and it'll get me something like a Poisson or a messy looking equation for pressure on the right hand side with second derivatives. So let's see how that's done. So I'm gonna take a divergence of that equation in a moment. Okay, so we start from this, that's where, so we start with those equations, which I was just uh, showing. Uh, take, take the divergence through, and then you can do, do various calculations. I'm saving you the algebra. Uh, basically, you can sh show that the left hand side and some of the right hand side can be combined to give you this expression for d delta dt minus delta squared we saw before. And then we have this funny gamma tilde term. This does not mean non-dimensional. It just it stands for um, a bunch of stuff. But this stuff here 
depends on things that without tiny derivatives. It depends on zeta, which depends on u and v, derivatives of u and v. It depends on Laplacian of h. Um, delta depends on derivatives on u and v. So if this is known in terms of h, u, and v, no tiny derivatives. Um, and so we have one equation telling us this is equal to this, and we had an equation back here telling you that um, p bar n is related to the same group of terms. So you can take this equation here, if you like a relation, um, and plug it into this equation here, combine the two, and what happens is that, well, that I saved you some algebra, so you basically can use the original relation that told you what p bar n was in terms of delta, turn it around, you get this, and finally combine everything, you get a single linear elliptic equation for p bar n given the gamma tilde right here. I'm not saying it's an easy equation, um, but it's linear. Um, p bar n only appears in a linear way. It has non-constant coefficients, which is its only trouble, if you like. So you have to use you know, fancy numerics maybe to solve it, but uh, it's not so bad. Um, but it's guaranteed to be solvable for all positive values of h, which is the only physical regime that you're interested in. So this always has a solution. Um, so it's an explicit linear elliptic equation. So now with this equation, we now have p bar n given explicitly in terms of h, u, and v, which is basically what this um, funny symbol stands for. It's a combination of h, u, and v. Um, and uh, then given that, you basically um, don't need to solve this equation anymore. Okay, so or you effectively, or you can use this equation still, but now p bar n is known explicitly in terms of u, v, and h without a time derivative on u. Okay. So we call that the vertically average model just to indicate uh, the importance of vertically averaging, but really it's the Sari Green Nagdi model, but made explicitly. Um, so the only difference between the two models is that there's a non hydrostatic pressure diagnosed from H, U, and V at each instant of time. Okay, I think, let's see if there's a good time to stop. Okay, I'll just write down the final equations and I'll probably pause here and we can all take a break and come back in 10 minutes or so. Um, so just to, re to recap, you get three prognostic equations, two for momentum, which are u and v. You have this new equation, new term here, which you didn't have in shallow water. You have the same one you have in shallow water for the mass equation. And then you get this new equation that diagnoses the pressure from u, v, and h, effectively, on the right-hand side. Um, and we'll, so, we'll see in a moment that, um, that the, unlike in the shallow water model, all the conservation laws simply followed by vertically averaging those in the 3D parent model. That's not to say the shallow water model isn't conservative, it is. Um, it's, it's sort of fortunate that it works out that way, but the green Nagy model falls directly by vertically averaging the uh, full 3D model. Now, answering a question I imagine you will answer is, or ask, is that I think if you start from the hydrostatic 3D model, and you did vertically averaging there, you would probably get the shallow water model and its invariance exactly in the same way. You had to start from a consistent model that already has the invariance before you do the averaging of those invariants to get invariance in the um, reduced model. Yes. Okay, so considering I've gone for 55 minutes, I was going to take a break, but that's in the next part. I thought that, so what I'm gonna talk about next will be demonstrating that this is better. What, what's different here? What new features do you get? Now, some new features have been known for a number of years, like decades, um, in terms of how linear waves are different. Um, but in terms of comparing with the full 3D parent model, no one's done that before, as far as we know. So we were the first to do that, and we can demonstrate that the green negative model is more accurate for you know, comparisons with the 3D model. So I'll show that in the next hour. It's non-local in the sense you mean that you have to get the pressure in this non-local way. Yeah. There's a further I mean, there's other 
Yeah, you're right. That this is a it's a hyperbolic system for three equations, but there's a there's a non-locality coming in here, which you don't have in other cases. But that's a good thing. It, you'll find that that's the thing that that's the savings grace of this model. It's harder computations to do this, but it's not stiff like the shallow water system is. Stiff meaning that the shallow water system has indefinite frequencies. The frequencies go to infinity as the scale goes to zero. Whereas in the green negative model, we'll see they're bounded. This is a good this is a good thing. Moreover, the shocks, which I was mentioning every all, all the time yesterday and being violating shallow water, don't occur in the green negative system. So they're stopped at the scale of the free surface depth and they become bores. Now with um, the some of the properties of this um, green Nagy system, or the vertically average equation. So this is a paper I was referring to in JFM by Miles and Salmon. It's a great read, a paper to read. It talks about derivation of these equations by a variational approach, which is in some ways analogous to what I've just gone through, but more rigorous perhaps. Um, but the nice thing is that if you go to the uh, full equations and write down the energy, and then you vertically average, then you can show that the uh, vertically averaged equations, all, all what's happening here is that um, vertically averaging doesn't change U and V because they're already vertically averaged fields. Um, integrating over Z just picks up a factor H here. Um, but here you pick up a third H cubed on delta squared. This is coming in from the vertical velocity squared when you integrate over Z. Um, and then this is the usual potential energy part. So you have three parts of the kinetic energy here. This is the vertical velocity two horizontal components here. And the, the new term here in the green Nagy system is absent in the shallow water system. Um, and then finally, uh, potential vorticity um, in the green Nagy system has this form, which is the usual shallow water form, and an additional complicated term here involving the Jacobian of delta and H. Um, and again, this term must be excluded from the shallow water model. So I might spend a few minutes showing you how this term comes from, um, because I think it's it's a lot to believe or take for granted that potential vorticity follows directly out of vertically averaging. So let's see how that happens. Um, so we're gonna go back to the beltrami rosby artel potential vorticity. There may be other names we should be throwing in that list, um, but uh, um, was it Lagrange yesterday or something? But I'm not sure, but that's different. Uh, but we're gonna start from the definition in this physical system of potential vorticity, where theta now is an arbitrary materially conserved field uh, satisfying dt to dt equals zero. I'm gonna use it for a vertical coordinate. And the idea is that I'm gonna take theta equals zero at the bottom and theta equals one on the free surface that equals h. This, in fact, this is what I do in the three-dimensional numerical simulations we'll be seeing. I introduce this coordinate so I can represent um, flow variables on each theta surface. And I'm hoping the theta surfaces don't overturn. And they don't, fortunately, but uh, um, it's useful as a representation as long as they don't overturn. But irrespective of that, if theta is materially conserved field, we know from the Beltrami theory, basically that the absolute vorticity dot into grad theta is a materially conserved quantity in the three-dimensional equations. All right, so we have this um, in the full 3D Euler equations. So now what we do is we say that let the height be the squiggly z, um, um, which depends on x, y, the coordinate surface you're on. So this is basically the height of a coordinate surface, theta equals constant. Um, and it's theta each, theta times h. And if we then use this to define theta, theta divided by z over h, we can calculate grad theta. ez is the vertical unit vector here by taking the gradient of z. Um, and the gradient here probably is 3D. So yeah, so differing from, so this grad here is no longer the 2D grad operator anymore. It's the full three-dimensional one. I should really put a grad three maybe. Um, and it's, it has to be here. So that in three dimensions, you get this term here, and then you get a further term for this, X, because H only depends on X and Y, the gradient really is just a two-dimensional gradient. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm taking any theta, could be put here, but the theta I'm gonna take has the property that's zero on z equals zero and one on this one, and I can actually define it through this equation here. 
effectively f d is equal to z over h here. And if I then calculate, so then doing this, taking the gradient, you get this form here. It's just a basic uh, calculation. And what we need to do is calculate that, take that gradient, dot into the uh, material, into the absolute vorticity, and look at the form of Q. So without making an approximation over, just do, do the whole vertical variation. You do that, well, first of all, the vertical vorticity, because U and V are independent of height, some terms are missing. So the Z derivative terms on U and V are gone. So you have just the vertical um, terms in the X and Y vorticity components. You have the vertical vor vorticity here. Replacing the vertical velocity by minus delta Z, um, you get then this term here using the incompressibility condition. Then forming this inner product here, you get that Q has the form Z to plus F over H. This is the um, hydrostatic form that we know. Um, and then you get this additional term coming from these uh, bits, the horizontal vorticity term, Z squared over H squared times the Jacobian delta H. And then it just, then vertically averaging this over H, um, this doesn't change, this is already independent of Z. And this, the only Z, Z, Z dependence is here in the Z squared, and it gives you the factor of one third here. And this is where green, the Sari green Nagde uh, potential vorticity comes from. The new stuff's coming from the fact that in shallow water, you'll be neglecting these terms here. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. So. True. So what? What the, this is the this is the potential vorticity the potential vorticity that should be in the model. Um, is this one when you do vertically averaging, if you didn't make the hydrostatic approximation. If you make the hydrostatic approximation, you can show this term is negligible compared to this term. I think that's the way it has to work. No, because delta and H are non, uh, they, this Jacobian is non-zero even in shallow water. I think what happens is that this, you can show that this is negligible by a factor of H squared over L squared compared to this term. So I've done this analysis recently in a magnetic context. So this term is neg, it has of order H over L squared. This is basically using QG scaling. So if you use the QG scaling entries before, you can see that that would be true. They don't, this term doesn't appear in shallow water equations. So in other words, shallow water um, miraculously conserves its quantities, probably because it starts from the premise that you, you start with a conservative hydrostatic 3D model, and you do the vertically averaging there, and you never have to go through and worry about the hydrostatic approximation. So I haven't worked that out, but I think that's where it's coming from. Whereas here, what I've done is I started from 3D Euler, which is non-hydrostatic. You're forced to get a term of this form, and then in shallow water, you drop it. That's why I was, when before I was saying that, okay, you have this term, that should not appear in shallow water. This does not appear in shallow water. These are terms that are always H over L squared smaller than the terms you keep in these equations. No, it's this is the this is the vertical velocity here. Yeah. This is vertical kinetic energy, which is ignored in the shallow water approximation. So there, there is vertical velocity in the shallow water equations, exactly like in Green Magdi, but you ignore the vertical um, kinetic energy. So you know it, that's what's so fishy about it. If you go through and you think about it. You drop this, that, this, and then you hope that everything's conserved at the end. Miraculously, it is. So in shallow water, um, if you drop the red terms here and here, that is the energy invariant for the, the equations. This is the potential vorticity invariant for the equations. But if you include the hydrostatic part, non-hydrostatic parts, you have to include the red term here and the red term there. 
and you get and you can and I can and I've just shown that you can get them directly by vertically averaging of the full exact three D quantities. But I think what happens is that 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 in the three D non hydrostatic the three D hydrostatic model, this is already something like the potential vorticity in that model. Okay. All right, so who, going on. What, so this this stuff is relatively well known. So this is stuff that's been around for some time. So let's look at first the linear spectra, uh, linear wave spectra about a for flow on a state of rest. So now we're thinking about you know the, again the flat bottom condition. We have a three dimensional fluid with a free surface on it, um, and there are um, curves in here um, showing the full model. The black curves here, if you can see, they're black. Blue and black are not very easy to distinguish, but this is showing the scaled frequency, frequency multiplied by the mean depth of the fluid divided by the short wave <coughs> gravity wave speed, or root GH here. Um, so this scaling here is natural for the 3D model. Um, and um, the curve, these two plots are the same. One's just a um, showing larger range of horizontal wave numbers. So this is horizontal wave number multiplied by the free surface height. Um, shallow water theory assumes that you're in the long wave limit, which means you're much less than one. So shallow water theory basically is assuming you're down here, okay? Um, and uh, the 3D dispersion relationship um, that is sort of out of a textbook involving hyperbolic functions um, has this form right here, this black curve here. And the, there are dashed curves which are showing the non-rotating case. So and otherwise, I've taken a characteristic rotational uh, or coilless frequency of arbitrary four pi, so that I get some interesting values for phase speed. And I mean, these results depend on the parameters you choose, but they're characteristic of simulations that you would typically use to compare shallow water and, and such um, order one values. Um, so anyway, you have the black curve here. Um, focus on the rotating cases. The shallow water curve is the one that rises indefinitely with wave numbers. So this is the um, short wave catastrophe that's going on, the ultraviolet catastrophe. Um, and the green Nagy model is the blue curve, which hugs alongside until roughly wave number one. Um, and it's not bad up to wave number two. This is extended further out. Yeah, you can see that the green Nagy model doesn't do well for very short scales. It's saying that basically the frequency goes to a constant. And the shallow water one frequency goes to uh, the, the waste, the phase speed, frequency over wave number goes to a constant, so it just keeps increasing with k. And the actual situation is that it's growing like the square root of k. Okay, so it's going to a constant, square root of k, and k. And these are three models. All right, so the green Nagy model is supposed to be able to capture scales of order k h equals one, um, although one can't prevent in simulations k h from being arbitrarily small or large. Unless you have a truncation in your wave in your numerics, and of course you always do. So actually, most simulations are are operating where they're stopping here or well below that limit. In reality, if you think you think about grid scales, et cetera, for like global atmospheric models, they're only approaching where kh is order one. GN models overcorrected in this sense that its frequencies become bounded, right? Now, but you know another model that's like that. So think about 3D. Three, yeah. If you remove the hydrostatic approximation, it shifts up to the red curve. So the difference between the red and the blue curves are here, this is the original shallow water model, hydrostatic. Um, this is the green Nagy model, which is including some non hydrostatic terms, but not completely correctly, correctly. And this is the full model, which right. should be doing this. Absolutely. The truth is in the middle. <laughs> That's right. Yep. So the blue line is the green, the green Nagy approximation to the 3D equations. And the shallow water model is the shallow water approximation to the 3D equation, okay? Um, arguably, you can, you know, within order ones, you know, they're not, they're both 
giving some approximation to the dispersion relationship over the important part, which is down here, where the bottles are valid. So this is why this is the main focus here. But over this range, at least, the green Nike model does a very good job capturing the full non-hydrostatic model, um, where shallow water starts to depart for higher frequencies. Okay. Well, you know, as I said, you know, if you're doing operating numerical regimes that are way down here, you don't care because you're not seeing a great deal of difference. But even down, right, but so for the shallow water model, even for weight numbers 0.5, you can see already see a difference taking place between the shallow water and the full um, model. Okay, so there's already a discrepancy in frequencies. It's not capturing them well, whereas the green Nike model captures them much better. That has to be some. There has to be some merit to that, even if you don't believe um, KH greater than one. Okay. The red dashed. The dashed no. The dashed lines are only the. Uh, no, they're, they're corresponding to f equals zero. The non-rotating waves. Yeah, if you want to call them Kelvin, yeah. Okay. So the, the non-rotating case and the rotating case. I'll be focusing on the rotating cases um, here. All right, so that's just linear theory. Let's see what happens in, in the actual 3D equation. So this is, uh, these are isosurfaces of um, a, what's something so often called the um, linearized potential vorticity anomaly. It turns out to be an easier field to interpret. The vertical vorticity minus F times the H tilde here corresponds to the non-dimensional free surface, basically the, the free surface displacement divided by capital H. Um, this is the field shown in the 3D order equation. So zeta depends on x, y, z, t. H still does, does not here. Um, but this turns out to be an important field to look at. It's like potential vorticity. This is, so I start with basically a jet. So this corresponds to a flow um, of a um, moving from left to right across the image here. Um, and uh, the, you have negative and positive vorticity um, I think yeah, it's negative, positive, negative. I'm trying to think what's is it a double jet. It could be a double jet flow. So it's anyway, it's an unstable flow which breaks up into a bunch of eddies which separate out. Initially, at t equals zero, I haven't shown t equals zero. Initially, is it, the, the wave perturbations are hardly noticeable. It's, it's smaller. So it's starting from, unsta it's an unstable, weakly perturbed state. Um, and the distribution of zeta and all fields that could be made two-dimensional are two-dimensional. So we start with a two-dimensional velocity field, two-dimensional vorticity field, two-dimensional divergence field, right? So we start everything 2D in the 3D model. And we say, okay, does it stay 3D or not? Or 2D or not? Okay? And well, if you go over here, you can sort of believe that everything here looks pretty uh, much independent of height. So this is, it stays remarkably 2D. I'm not, I, I'm not asking you to look at a picture like that and say, yeah, that's pretty convincing. Okay? You need to actually quantify how, how 3D or 2D this is. What would ruin? Oh, initiated? Oh, plenty of reasons. So I remember when I started the whole process of the 3D equations, I wrote down this ugly equation for PN, for the non-hydrostatic pressure you invert from a 3D Laplacian. The right-hand side has lots of places where Z dependence can form. Okay, that's going to then feed back. So remember, once you have the pressure, the pressure depends on Z. You take a derivative of that in the momentum equations, it's going to still have Z dependence. And that's going to feed into the X and Y velocity components. They'll develop a Z dependence and so on. So the whole thing immediately from time zero, you get Z dependence developing. You don't see it here because I'm looking at the wrong field. In vertical vorticity, it stays remarkably independent of height. But if I look at divergence, just a moment, which is supposed to be independent of height, it's not. Okay, it, it starts initially, but then it, it changes. So let me just uh, look at the parameters here. So this is, these are characters. So the, the mean depth is H equals 0. 0.4. The domain is um, minus pi to plus pi, minus pi to plus pi non-dimensional units. So 0.4 is a it's fairly substantial uh, depth in these kinds of experiments. Um, the Rosby number in terms of uh, this measure here, which I was mentioning to Nathan earlier, um, I deduced this in this experiment. It's pretty substantial. So it's definitely on the edge of what QG would be. So 0.5771, so it's a fairly nonlinear flow. And the Froude number 
again, noticeably smaller than the Rossby number, but it's really going from about 0.17 to 0.23 here in this ex um, experiment. Okay, this is the null hydrostatic pressure which I was mentioning. So from the word go, from t equals zero, um, you can show that it's 3D. It has to be, and it's 3D because the non hydrostatic pressure has to satisfy these boundary conditions, one being that its derivative is zero at set equals zero, and the other one that it's zero at set equals h. And unless Pn is zero everywhere, it's going to have vertical dependence. And the vertical dependence it exhibits is quadratic and z. It's, the, it's this quadratic form we saw before. And if you look at this, they're all nice rounded structures um, that you see appearing. But that's going to then feed into the horizontal momentum equations and the 3D equations and make things depend on z. I'm, I'm painting this picture that things are going to get bad, but it's not going to be that bad. Yeah? So we're seeing the non hydrostatic pressure in 3D. The full, well, not the full pressure, just PN, the non hydrostatic part. So this is, this is small. I, didn't written, I haven't written down scales, but this is on the order of 10 to the minus 3 of the hydrostatic part. There's a small component um, extra. This is the horizontal divergence. So at early times, time five, you can convince yourself this is pretty much independent of height. It looks like it. But if you look later at this time, um, you can definitely see that there are variations in height taking place. And if you zoom in on that, you can see this better. This is the divergence field. You can see there are um, some small domes like here and here, it's stuck to the upper surface here, some at the bottom surface there. Um, it's not a 2D field anymore. So the divergence itself is becoming 3D. Um, again, it's small compared to um, magnitudes are on the order of 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2 of the vorticity. So it's 10% to 1% of the vorticity magnitude. I'll probably have the numbers in a minute and some images coming up, but this is still relatively small. And this is saying that this 3D flow stays pretty close to QG balance. And we're doing the full 3D, and this is a messy calculation, takes hours on a computer to run this, and you can do QG and get the same results in a few seconds, pretty much. It's so much different. But anyway, it's not quite fair to say that. Here's, um, uh, so, so another advantage of the VA model, the green Nike model, is that the vortical flow is, as I mentioned earlier, very accurately captured in this model. Now, I'm not showing the VA model. I'm not showing the green Aggie model here. I'm showing the shallow water model. This is what I've done here on the left-hand image. As I've taken the latest time in the calculation where you see these rolled-up eddies, these, the red being positive vorticity, the blue regions are negative vorticity around it. Uh, you see filaments and characters. It looks 2D. And what I've done here is I've taken the full 3D field and integrated over the vertical and averaged it. And that's, that is what I should be getting in an average model like shallow water. So here's the shallow water approximation. If you stopped here and you didn't look at the difference, you say, wow, that's good enough. And probably it is. For most purposes, if, you know, after all the shallow water models are a big approximation, you might say, okay, that's a pretty good job. That this simple model, which takes about a hundredth of the time to compute from this one, um, is doing a very good job of capturing vertical vorticity in detail. I mean, detailed aspects of this are the same. And here are the differences. So the the magnitudes go to about six and minus six here. Here, the difference is around 10%. And the quadrupolar structure here indicates the phases are off. So the vortices are slightly rotated a little bit. So the only thing that's, the, the only error in shallow water here is really that the, the, the vortices are rotated a little too much or too little. Okay? Now, remember that picture. It's gonna look like the same picture. The same picture, but now for the vertically average model, okay, slightly shifts up. But again, um, they look very, very close. And the difference is here. Notice the scale here, 0 0.003. It's basically 200 times smaller. So the vertical vorticity now, differences in vertical vorticity are negligible compared to shallow water. So this is the demonstration that at least for the vertical vorticity and for potential vorticity-like things, this model gives you a much better approximation for the dynamics. You know, we're talking about minuscule things. Maybe it's not important. You don't care about the fact that it's that much more accurate. Um, but uh, it does show that there is a gain in accuracy by including the non hydrostatic effects, despite the fact that we've seen their internal inconsistencies, like in the divergence field. Oh, well, the, so the 
efficiency of the VA model is about two to three times slower than the shallow water model. And it's being slowed down, the VA model. Yeah, shallow water is the VA fastest. Preferred. Oh, VA compared to 3D, again, it's probably 100 times quicker. Yeah, same water as 2D shallow water. There's like a five to two or three difference in terms of cost. And it's all to do with the fact that the pressure, um, non hydrostatic pressure, the P bar N, has to be deduced by, in spectral ways, you have to do an iteration. So you have to iterate to find the pressure and then you stick it in. And the equation is a little more complicated. Okay, so summary. Um, so, wow, that's pretty quick. Um, <laughs> um, no, I'm sure I'm not done yet. There'll probably be some questions still, but uh, so I hope that uh, I've managed to show you that um, how you can deduce reduced models, how you can develop reduced models from more complete parent models. Um, and of course, they are important research tools, even if they can't forecast the weather because they normally can't. Um, in fact, even the sophisticated models that forecast the weather, you can argue you can't forecast the weather always very well. And there are lots of models out there that are competing um, that do it to various degrees of accuracy. Um, and then we, the first thing we did is to show how to derive the quasitropic model in the, in the so-called traditional way by an asymptotic expansion in the small parameter like the Rossby number here. But we, then we showed a very different way using making onsots, um, avoiding any asymptotic expansion to derive and improve shallow water equations and also, also the shallow water model itself from the parent 3D equations. So what I'll do next time tomorrow, we'll be talk about in more detail balance and balance, which I've been using the words over and over and over, uh, but we're gonna see that and uh, eventually Probably won't get to this, but if we there is time on Friday, I'll talk about some of the numerical methods that are behind all this. I think that was motivated by the 3D dispersion relationship, because if you look at the dispersion relationship for linear waves on a free surface, you see that they they barely vary with height. So the, the modes don't have a significant vertical variation. So you say, okay, well, let's let's go with that and see what happens if we do this. It's the way that people derive that variational balance models. They make an assumption, they stick it in the Lagrangian, which is effectively what we're doing, but hiding that fact, and then turning the crank on the variations. Out pops all the conservation laws and they get a set of dynamical equations consistent with their onsets and with all the conservation laws. And you can go and put in almost anything as an onsets. You'll get something out. It may be a crap balance model, but you'll get something that's consistent, okay? No, you don't. You have to do the final check, which I just said. And this is the, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's not, I mean, this is, a, this is something that, you're not going to be sitting there writing 20 papers a year. You have to sit there and write the, the stupid numerical code that does on 3D at the way for the computing. Well, I mean, it takes a lot of effort to do this, and you don't really want to do it. You know what the answer is going to be, more or less, but you still have to go through and do the work. And what we did, when we did this 3D thing, we said, Surely there's something I can pull off the shelf. There must be a model out there that does that. We couldn't find anything that closely approximated to that model. So we had to write our own, okay? So that is that is a setback and you have to do that kind of work sometimes to, to do that. Also, we wanted to make sure that the models that we compared were comparing apples and apples. We don't want to basically vary the model so much. We take, say, Daedalus, which you're familiar with, um, run something there and we don't know all the black box parameters they choose. Then we run our own model and say, there's differences. Well, are the differences physical or the numerical approximations or they, they use this type of time stepping method or they use this, this inversion method, use this stagger grid. You know, when you go into the numerical realm, you're talking about, it really gets dirty quickly. Yeah. Well, we, well, the, the, the short answer is that there's no, there's no definite way of knowing, okay, because we don't have an exact solution to compare with. We can, of course, check things like linear dispersion relationships, except we can make sure that things invert properly. We can do some temporal tests. We always do that. You develop, develop a numerical code. You basically have a whole series of tests. You run it through, and if you pass those tests, you say, okay, let's let it loose and hope that it works in the more general cases that uh, we'd like to apply it. Sometimes you get burnt and it doesn't work, or you may be fooled to think that you're getting the right results or you're not. But I'm pretty confident after 
some decades of doing this kind of work that this is probably a correct code. And I like the idea that the code is based on exactly the same fast Fourier transforms, the same uh, way of representing the grid. The sa everything is the same, same time stepping method, same semi implicit approach. All the aspects of the code are the same, except for the physical changes of the equations. Okay, but I use the same numerical methods for all. So I know that I'm doing everything the same, and I can attribute the differences in the models to the differences in the equations. And yeah, you know, there's some maybe effective numerics as well, but you know, you can check that by, you know, of course, you run the calculation at double resolution, half resolution. You make, make sure that you, you, that's obvious. You know, that's a basic thing. Yeah, you, it's got to be, you have to keep, you don't want the results to be only applicable to one resolution. Yeah. Yeah, you have to basically demonstrate convergence. And, you know, and one thing, um, again, you know, if you're doing weather forecasting, you might, you know, be interested in getting any solution, you want a robust solution at any, you know, as quick as possible. So you can use a big time step. You don't really care whether things are done that accurately. Here, I'm interested in getting it really accurately. So I'll use a gravity wave resolving time step and pay the price, just take the computer time to do it, because I want to make sure that I, I, I get the, um, all the dynamics that the system has. So I'm not trying to withhold any of the potential gravity waves that are in the system. Yeah, that's important. All right, so let's go on um, about balance now. Um, and um, I'll talk about uh, furthermore about balance relations we've already seen a bit on, but um, the, that last part of the last talk was really about um, these models that have already gravity waves in them, so now we're going to remove them again um, and go back to this concept of PV inversion. Um, and we'll look at the, again, um, looking at uh, hydrostatic, non hydrostatic shallow water models. I'll probably only do the first section here, possibly today, look at some new turbulence simulations and um, trying to detect the uh, wave motions in both hydrostatic and non hydrostatic shallow water models. And there are some interesting results that arise there in terms of big differences that occur in these systems in turbulent shallow water flows. Um, so we've already gone through this slide basically that, uh, you know, what are balanced relations? So we, we know that we often find there must be relationships between fields like geostrophic and hydrostatic balance. Um, we've seen that hydrostatic balance basically implies that vertical acceleration is negligible and geostrophic balance can be um, sim uh, symmetrically thought to be as that the horizontal acceleration is negligible in the equations. Um, and we can use these balances as shown last time or earlier that we can construct QG or quasi-strophic balance models where we lose two time derivatives and we filter these inertial gravity waves. Okay, now go on. The same reason why we the same reason why we don't want to do 3D when we go do, do, do 2D. We want, to, we want to simplify, we want to reduce all the time. Yeah, yeah but we, have to, we, have, we do this because we think that um, we, we see that the gravity waves are not having much impact and we have to determine whether they have that or not. So I guess there's a lot of years of, of background here where people found time and time again that often there's negligible impact of these gravity waves on on the balanced motion. So there, there, there's something underlying that we're trying to get at. So the whole big industry of balance and developing balance models that erupted in the 70s, 80s, maybe even earlier, back an hour and 60s, whatever, you, you get this came from the reckoning, and Charlie himself, of course, was you know the idea that he took Richardson's famous experiment, which failed in terms of weather forecasting, and then realized, oh, well, just use the QG model over a sphere, or something, you know, some simple barotropic vorticity equation on a sphere. And already it was better than using the full primitive equations. You know, you think that you have everything um, and uh, the, the barotropic vorticity equation already gives you some qualitative picture of weather fronts moving, et cetera. On the, so this is what Charney found. He was using basically the simplest balance model at that time. And that's what led then to all this idea that there must be something under that. We can, you know, these models are st more stable. Um, you can use bigger time steps. You can but of course you lose something. Um, you may lose detail, but you get the bigger picture. So it's a question of what you want. I mean, it's like everything, there's a norm for everything. So if you, you might decide that your favorite field is temperature, 
I'm going to put all my weight in temperature. I want to get temperature right. Someone else say, no, I tend to vorticity. I want that right. So you can, everybody has their your view. And, and of course, in, in currently in like data simulation, which I don't want to get into either, but you know, there are real serious issues about how important certain fields are in terms of weighting them when you're simulating data. To get a weather forecast model running or to keep it running, you nudge it with data, but you have to also decide, well, what are the importances of different fields to contributing to the dynamics? And there's debate about that as well. So anyway, I'm not gonna get into that area, but it's basically a muddle, a bit of a muddle. So I'm gonna talk about the more general things about, hmm? well, I just wanna, I'll, I'll just basically talk about this slide and then I'll stop here. But um, so the idea is that uh, we're gonna get to this general principle that say in like a, a shallow water system or a green agri system, if you like, um, you have three variables, H, U, and V. So we know there are three equations. In general, you can write balance relationships as any differential, in fact, integral differential equation um, link between H, U, and V. So these are basically the so-called balance relations. I'm gonna call these balance relations. And I've written them very generally as F and G of H, U, V equals zero. And um, so using these, you can eliminate two of the equations and then choose, well, sorry, then you, um, then leave the one equation uh, like Q as the master variable because it's special because it's materially conserved. Not everybody agrees with this, but uh, largely people would argue that potential vorticity is the variable describing the underlying balance as the um, advected field. It's the only one that has this property. And so using this alongside these balance relations gives you this idea of PV inversion. Um, as I mentioned, I think the bill earlier that there are hierarchies of these balance relations that exist whose accuracy depends on Rosby and Froude numbers, and there's some article written earlier about that. All right, I said I'd stop here, but I wanna give you just an example of F and G, just in the, no, the known QG system. So we went through QG earlier. They do not depend on time, that's right. There's spatial differential operators or integral differential operators. Um, now, there is something called optimal PV balance, which I'm, I, I'm trying to forbid myself from talking about because it's more complicated. They then depend on time too. So I'm not gonna talk about that here. Marcel Oliver in the, week, in the week after this, in his lecture, after mine on Tuesday, we'll talk about optimal PV balance and talk about that it can be more subtle than this. But let's start with it. This is the traditional way that, if you like, Mackenauer and Trivia and other people started the idea of balance earlier. They weren't thinking maybe along this general lines, but then it became obvious that this is the kind of system you're looking at. This doesn't tell you anything yet, but let's take a specific F and G. So a specific, a specific F would be delta itself, which is saying that the divergence of U is equal to zero. This is what we use in quadratic balance. So there, here's a differential relationship between two of the variables, U and V. It doesn't depend on H, but that's, that's our G. And our H would be setting what's called the agiostrophic vorticity, or F times it, this is just the relative vorticity here. I'm just writing it this way so that you just see U, V, and H here, right? Yeah, right. So you, you basically, but anyway, the, the gamma depends on U and V and H. And so this is my, my G function, okay? Um, so F and G are equal to zero here. These are my relations that I use in QG balance. And, and then that leads to the QG system we found before. I'll stop here and talk about more exotic things in in tomorrow and we'll just we'll review this a little bit at start of tomorrow okay